I love it. I love that what God is doing here is so much bigger than what God is doing here. God's always working in ways that are beyond our comprehension. And so if this is your first time here, it's an honor to have you. My name is Jeff. I'm the pastor here at LifePoint, and I look forward to being able to meet you, possibly today or in the weeks to come. I'd love to shake your hand and just say welcome to the church. And we are glad to have you. We're continuing a series today called Fill in the Blank. Fill in the blank. I wanna encourage you to get something to take notes with. You'll find a note card on the seat back in front of you or they're under your chair if you happen to be here on the front row. Also, uh, if you're more of a digital person, you can get your phone out and follow along. There's a LifePoint app. And in the app, you'll find the message notes. So if you'd rather just follow along digitally, feel free to do that. We want you to be able to track with it. I believe God's gonna put something on your heart today. Probably not a bunch of things, probably just one thing. And if you write it down, you'll remember it. You'll be able to go back and revisit it this week. And so I wanna encourage you to do that. Have that out. And let me give you a head start. If you've got a Bible today, two passages that I want you to go ahead and find so you'll be there when we get there. The first is gonna be Luke chapter six. So find Luke chapter six and then 2 Corinthians chapter nine. Both of these are in the New Testament. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it up to those passages. If you wanna use your phone, feel free. The scripture will also be here on the screens. But if you don't own a Bible, we'd love to give you one. Now, if you're just like a Bible collector and you got a bookshelf full, then don't get another one. But if you don't have a Bible at home that you understand, we would love to give you one. We give them away every weekend. And so before you leave, stop by in the lobby, go over to the tables, we call that our next steps area, and just say, hey, that Hamburglar looking guy on stage, he had, the, you guys, who remembers the Hamburglar? Come on, remember when they used criminals to sell fast food? That was great, can't really do that anymore, that's not very PC, but some of you don't even know what I'm talking about, that means you're young. Those of you that raise your hand, we're old. Anyway, go tell them the guy in the Hamburglar shirt, because that's what I think of when I get this shirt out of the closet, I'm like, that's my Hamburglar shirt, so. Now you know what I think. But go and tell him that, say, he said I could have a Bible and it is a gift to you. We want you to have it. And we're gonna fill in the blank today. We're gonna fill in the blank. And so the idea with this series is simply this. We're about being intentional about filling our life with the right things. When, when, with this, the idea behind the series is simply this. What you fill in the blank is going to flow from your life. So whatever you fill your life with, you will be full of. So with that in mind, I want us to go and look at Luke chapter six, verse 45 together. Luke 6, 45 says this. It says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. Notice, good man, good things, good is stored up in his heart. How do you store up good in your heart? You intentionally stockpile it there. So if you wanna be overflowing with good, we've gotta be intentional about filling our heart with good things. Now, an evil man, brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is what? Say it with me, the heart is full of. What this means is what comes out of our mouth originates in our heart. You know the way to say this is what starts in the heart will flow from your life. Uh, another way you could put this is what takes root in your heart will grow fruit in your life. Or to put it in terms of this fill in the blank, what you fill in the blank will flow from your life. It's so important that we're intentional about what we allow in our life and what we plant in our heart because it will grow, it will reap a harvest. And we wanna be full of good things. We wanna be blessings to those that we're around. And, and so it's important that we take some time and we think about what am I gonna fill my life with? Well, last week we talked about how do we live a thankful life? We do that by being intentional about filling our life with thanks. So to get us to our passage for today and our topic for today, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter nine. In 2 Corinthians chapter nine, the apostle Paul is encouraging the church to, to live a lifestyle of generosity. If you were to back up to chapter eight, you can read this on your own time, but in chapter eight, he's commending them for their generosity amidst difficulty and tragedy. They've gone through really tough times and he says, you're, you're overflowing in generosity despite your circumstances. It tells me that I don't have to be a victim to my circumstances, that I can rise above it, that I can be a person of generosity. And what he's doing in chapter nine is he's fanning that flame of generosity. Let's look at this together. Second Corinthians nine, verse six, he says this, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So we introduced this idea last week. It's the biblical concept of sowing and reaping. And the idea is you reap what you sow. 
But if you sow a handful of seeds, you're gonna reap a small harvest. If you sow an abundance of seeds, you're gonna reap a large harvest. It's just logic, it just makes sense. And then he continues on. In verse seven, he says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a what? Say it with me, God loves a cheerful. If you got your Bibles, underline that word cheerful. God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So today, what we wanna fill in the blank with is this. We wanna fill in the blank with cheer. I wanna talk about living a cheerful life. If you're taking notes, just write cheerful, real big across the top. What does it look like to live a cheerful life? I mean, think about it. Cheerful, that's kind of a strange word, right? When was the last time you used the word cheerful or cheery or cheer? It just seems kind of strange, doesn't it? Like cheerful, you know, he's a, you don't describe somebody like, he's a real cheery guy, a real cheery fellow, chap. It doesn't sound like something we would say very much, you know? You seem exceptionally cheery on this blustery morn. It's, that's weird, right? Nobody's using, it just, it seems strange, but it's a, it's a biblical word. It's a great word. Now, we do all know that the best way to spread Christmas cheer is what? Singing loud for all to hear. So we can reference Christmas stuff now, okay? Now that Thanksgiving is behind us, we survived the purge, also known as Black Friday. We can now celebrate Christmas. I know some of you had your tree up like last week. I can't, I can't multitask my holidays, right? One at a time is all I can handle. So Christmas references can come more rapidly now. But cheerfulness, cheerfulness. What does it look like to, to celebrate and to live a life of cheerfulness? According to Paul, in the passage we just read, cheerfulness is a character trait that God loves. It is apparently the byproduct of generosity. And just like we acknowledged last week, there's a battle in our life over our attention. For instance, Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. The thief says, I wanna steal, kill, and destroy. There is a battle for your life. I would say there's a battle for your heart in the realm of generosity. There's a battle of whether or not your heart is going to be generous or whether it's going to be stingy and greedy. Generous or greedy. Generosity says, I get to give. I get to be a blessing. Greed says it's about what I can get. And so there's a difference here and we wanna live a life that is full of generosity. A cheerful heart is one that gives. It gives. And I believe generosity breaks the curse of greed. If you battle with greediness, and let's just be real, we all do from time to time. We all do. We all have a list of things we would love to have if we had more money. And many times we think, if I had this, I would then buy that. And what happens is we create this idea that if I, if I could just get more things, I could be happier. Well, what that does is that creates in your mind this idea that my happiness and contentment is based on what I have. That's a greedy mentality. Generous says, God, you have so richly blessed me. What would you have me do with that? It's a different perspective and it's a mentality that we're pursuing. And what's interesting is in this passage, when it says God loves a cheerful giver, the word cheerful is actually the Greek word hilaros. Hilaros, let's put that on the screen, hilaros. So you may wanna jot this down, but I want everybody to say hilaros together. You gotta roll that L, hilaros, on three. One, two, three, hilaros. That's pretty good, one more time, ready? One, two, three, hilaros. Hilaros, I don't know if I'm rolling the L or the R, but I'm rolling something in the middle there, so obviously I know what I'm doing. <laughs> hilaros, hilaros. It's where we get the word hilarious. You can see it, you can see it right there, right? It's where we get the word hilarious. The idea is that God loves a hilarious giver. What would it look like to live in a way that when we give, there's just this hilarity, there's this humor, this enjoyment, this laughter that goes along with it, this abundance, rather than like a stingy, I guess if I have to, mentality. What does it look like to live a cheerful lifestyle? You know, I can't help but notice when we approach December, people seem to be a little more generous. I don't know if it's the people ringing bells outside of all the stores or the angel tree, things like that, but you see generosity come to the forefront for a lot of people. I know for us as a church, when I think back over our 12, almost 13 year history, I think back to the very beginning. You know, we held our first public service in February of 2006. However, in December of 2005, we did something really special. 
we, we made a decision that our church is going to be a generous church. We didn't really have much in the way of finances to, to really bless anyone with, but we weren't gonna let that limit us. We contacted a local school, Myrtle Grove Middle School. We talked to their social workers and we said, our church, which hadn't really started yet, wants to be a blessing. Could we provide Christmas gifts for kids in need? And when we were just a launch team in the process, dreaming of a church, we knew that generosity was gonna be at the core of who we are. And I think of all the years and all the gifts that have been provided. Many of you, you took a tag today or last week and you're gonna be buying a gift for a kid. There's gonna be a kid in our community opening presents that their parents could not provide, but they're gonna have them because of you and your generosity. And I want you to know I'm thankful for that. It's a big deal. It's a really big deal. You know, I also think about this time of year as a church, we do something special called an outreach offering. Now, what is an outreach offering? It's an offering that we do that's above and beyond our regular giving. We ask everybody to seek God, to pray, and to sacrifice, and to give a gift, and the gift has, it's done all kinds of things over the years. Like, I remember when our church was in, we were meeting at Ashley High School, and we had this dream of drilling wells in Africa. We wanted to provide clean water for communities in Africa that had no access. And we had this idea, if we could raise enough money to drill some wells, we thought four wells would be pretty audacious. But as a church, we didn't drill four wells. The, you know, so much money was given, we drilled seven wells in Africa. It was amazing, it was incredible. And then I think about being able to, to partner up in the village called Lagutu in Uganda where we were able to build a school out of the generosity of this church. One of the trips I was on a few years ago, we had to dedicate a latrine. I was like, this is crazy. We're the only church that gives bathrooms, <laughs> a latrine to a community. It's like, tell me about the generosity. We give toilets. And, However, when you go there, it's a big, big deal. It is, it's amazing. And, and so your generosity has been able to do that. I think about how uh, in Chillicothe, Ohio, when our friends at Centerpoint were taking steps to acquire a facility, your generosity went first and said, we're gonna give to that. And we gave them a good deal of money. I think about building a school in La Chuscada in Nicaragua, where many of you have gone on missions trips, so you've rolled up your sleeves and you've served, poured blood, sweat, and tears into that community so they can have a school. You made that happen. And this year, as we approach our Christmas offering, our outreach offering, and it's about capacity, it's about creating space at both of our campuses. You may not know this, but we have two locations right now as a church. We have our Pine Valley location, and then we have our Leland location, and both of them have capacity challenges. They're great problems, but we've gotta figure them out. We started this church so that if anyone in this community needs to find the hope of Jesus, there's gonna be a seat for them. And so it's amazing to think that, you know, two of our three services at Pine Valley are full. Leland is busting at the seams. They have a reproduction issue over there. I'm telling you, the kids are running. It is, it's crazy. They're such a good problem. There's a lot of love in that community, apparently. And so we made the decision. As a team, we talked about it. We said, you know what? This year's outreach offering is going to empower LifePoint Church to reach out more effectively to our community by creating capacity for friends and neighbors and coworkers to be able to come to church. And so we're asking everybody to pray and just simply ask God, God, what would you put on my heart and what would you have me do, my family, to provide for this offering? And this is a sacrifice, it's above and beyond. I know some families, every year they give an offering and it's like their birthday gift to Jesus. You may wanna approach it that way, but I wanna ask you to pray and just say, God, what would you have me do? What we're doing here at LifePoint, it's, it's pretty exciting, we started the year and um, we, we began this conversation about how do we create space for more people and capacity to grow, but do it in a manner that is relationally healthy. Like we're not just stacking services on top of people and you know, you know, bringing people in and then shooing them out and more people in. And we really love relationships here at LifePoint. We love conversations in the lobby. And we realize the only way we can do this is by adding more, more seating capacity so that we can have more time between services to be able to interact with people. It's about people. And so we brought our architect in and he looked at our facility and he said, well, why don't you guys put a balcony? And we're like, well, I don't know, why don't we? We didn't know it was possible. So he started drawing up the plans and we started sending it out to bid. And in the next couple of weeks, the demolition's gonna begin happening on this back wall and a balcony is gonna go up and we're gonna gain about 400 more seats and we're gonna revamp our lobby and our flow. And we're gonna have space for more people in a relationally healthy way. And I just want you guys to know that it is your giving, your faithful obedience in returning the tithe and giving above and beyond that's allowed us to do that. This outreach offering is focused on us outfitting that with seats to put up there in that balcony. 
So we're asking you to just pray about what God would have you or your family do. I know this is the conversation that my family has been having. How many seats do we want to provide? They're $200 a seat. And you know you can provide a, you know several seats if you can't if, if two hundred dollars is a stretch I get it we're all in different places then you know just you're gonna say God what would you have me do at the end of the day it's about asking the Lord and doing what He says and so I want to invite you to just partner together and on December the 9th, as a church we're gonna give a special offering and it's gonna be about outfitting this location and then it's gonna be about positioning Leland to take their steps to find more space. And so we've got a goal of $120,000 across the two campuses and we believe that God has got everything we need. And so it gets me excited because when we do this, what we're doing is we're saying, God, we want to be cheerful, we want to be generous and in order for us to live a cheerful life, we've got to be intentional about what we put in to our life and generosity is a key value here at LifePoint Church. So I wanna talk today about qualities of a cheerful giver. Qualities of a cheerful giver. If we wanna live this hilarious life, this cheerful life, what does that even look like? What are some things we need to know? Here's the first, write this down. Number one, a cheerful giver knows that God is their supplier. A cheerful giver can give cheerfully because they know that God is their supplier. You could say God is our source. God is my supplier. In 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10, Paul says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. He's talking about our Father in heaven. Paul is saying God is our supplier, he is our source. And here's the thing, guys. In this life, either we believe that God has got us and he's our supplier or we don't. There is no middle ground. Either I believe that God will provide for me or I do not believe that God will provide and therefore I must provide for myself. It's one or the other. And what's, what's crazy to me is I see a lot of people that say, I trust God with my eternity, but I don't know that I can trust him with my reality. That's crazy, isn't it? Either I can trust God or I can't. I want you to know God's got you. He's got you. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, God's got you. Say, God's got you. You can trust him. You can trust him. Last time I checked, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got little bitty babies in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. So, don't worry, okay, stop that. Stop that. You, it was going there. It was. God's got it. He's got you. A cheerful giver knows that God is their supplier. He is my supplier. Here's the second thing, write this down. A cheerful giver knows that they are a distributor. God's the supplier, I'm the distributor. God's the supplier, I'm the distributor. When you know that God is your supplier, it is easier to let go of what you have. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier. When you choose to live open-handed, you're saying, God, I'm trusting you to put in my hand what I need, and I'm trusting you to take out of my hand what other people need. I'm living open-handed. I am a distribution center of the blessings of God. You know, we got to see this firsthand during Hurricane Florence. We made the decision that we were gonna bless our community by being a distribution center. And it's amazing what God did during that stretch. If you served here over the, uh, probably about the, the week to two weeks following the storm, we had supplies just you know, by the truckloads coming into our facility. It was amazing. We got to literally watch churches all over the nation sending box trucks here and we would offload them with forklifts and pallet jacks. And at one point you're looking around like, where did all of this come from? It's the church being generous, people being generous, and we stockpiled all this stuff, and then cars would come through, and they'd get meals, and we'd hear about churches and people with needs, and we'd load up box trucks, and we would deliver them all over the community, and I remember, I remember sitting there, and like all of a sudden, you're watching the supplies dwindle down. You're looking at your lobby, and you're like, I don't know, we're, we're running out, I guess this is the end of the line. And no sooner than you would run out, another truck would show up and fill it right back up. And I realized we can't outgive God. As long as there's a need, the supplier knows it and he'll provide what you need when you need it. And it was so amazing to watch that, but why can't that be the case in our life? Why can't we trust God as our supplier? We are the distributor that our life is about receiving from him and then passing that blessing on. It's like a river, think about it. A river is receiving water and sending water. What happens when it stops sending? It gets swampy, doesn't it? Turn to your neighbor and say, don't get swampy on me. People get swampy with their money sometimes. It's like, we get swampy. We're like, God bless me. And then we get blessed and we're like, huh, no blessing for you. 
and we get swampy. The difference is we stop sending it forward. We stop sending it out. It's crazy. Like, I remember, it used to make me nervous when, as a pastor, I would talk about money. People are like, oh, you can't talk about money because all churches want is your money. That's so crazy. That's so, I mean, think about it. Like, does God, God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. But he knows that in order to have your heart, you're gonna have to trust him with your money. Besides, you know, God's not broke, okay? Last time I checked, he's doing really well and does not need a spaghetti fundraiser to send people on a missions trip. He's doing okay. He's doing good. It's not God that needs money. It's God's people that need to learn to trust him with the money that he's blessed them with so that he can then begin to bless them with more. It's about us trusting God with what he's given us. And a cheerful giver knows I'm a distribution center. A distribution center. Have you noticed at LifePoint Church, and this is not a knock against any other church, but have you noticed that offering buckets have not come your way in a long time? Some of you didn't even realize that. You're like, I thought something was different. We don't, we don't have a special offering song where we receive the offering. And I want you to know that there's nothing wrong with churches that do that. We did that for a very long time. And I remember when we were moving into this facility, oh my goodness, this was scary. Pastor, do you remember this? This was scary. We were, we were taking steps from Roland Grice Middle School moving into this facility. So we were going from being portable with our expenses were fairly low to a facility with expenses that were gonna be higher. And we were coming in and we felt like God put on our heart that we were supposed to just teach people what God's word says. It says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I want people to know what God's word says when it comes to finances. Teach people about generosity. Teach them about obedience and tithing. Teach them and trust God to be our provider. And so I remember I felt like God was putting on our heart that we're gonna put offering boxes by the door and we're gonna stop passing the buckets. And I remember being like, just scared, because I'm like, well, God, we've never missed a bill and I'd sure hate for that to start when we get in this facility. Just being honest, it's walking by faith sounds awesome until you do it. Then you're like, oh man, how's this gonna work? I don't know how. I remember those first couple of weeks, you're like, guys, just reminding you, there's offering boxes by the door. Please don't confuse them with the trash cans. They're the boxes that say tithes and offerings. You can give there, you can give online, you can mail it in. I just remember being so nervous, but I remember thinking, you know what? I wanna pastor a church that's so in love with God and so committed to living out obedience that if they have to go out the doors, exit the building, go across the parking lot to put their offering in a box that hangs on a tree, they're gonna do it because they want to honor God. I don't want people to give out a compulsion or feel like their arms being twisted or like everybody's watching when the bucket goes by and... So we just made that decision. I gotta tell you, we've never missed a bill and God's blessing has been on it and we trust him. We watch him provide over and over and over and over. And I'm telling you, until you step out, you won't see him step in. But a cheerful giver knows, God, you are the supplier. I am the distributor. I'm the distributor. You know, I think about my wife and I. 20 years of marriage, we have made just about every bad financial decision you could make. You know, just let you know, if you're like, feel like you've paid the stupid tax a time or two, you're not alone, all right? We definitely have. But can I tell you, we have a lot of regrets financially, but we don't regret a single dollar that we have given to someone in need, a, a dollar that we've invested in an initiative at the church, even churches we used to be a part of. I love knowing that in some way, God empowered me to sow into my community of believers where we could impact the world. And I want you to know that when you truly believe that I am a distributor, you understand that a distributor's job is to distribute and send out resources knowing that your supplier is gonna fill the warehouse right back up. That's what we're called to do. As churches, we are storehouses. That's what the Bible calls us. So we receive God's blessings, we receive offerings, and then we distribute. This year alone, our church will have distributed over $200,000 of tithes and offerings that have come in to our community and around the world. I want you to know that's only possible because of your generosity and your obedience. We distribute, that's what we do, we distribute. A cheerful giver knows, God's my supplier, I'm the distributor. Here's number three, a cheerful giver leads with the heart. Leads with the heart. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, let's go back to this. It says, each of you should give what you have decided where? In your heart, in your heart. You have to give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. I would add manipulation, for God loves a cheerful giver. So it's about our heart. We need to learn to lead with the heart. Notice it doesn't say they lead with the head, they lead with the heart. I'm gonna be honest, this is scary. Because how many know your head and your heart disagree sometimes? You hear like a sad story, you catch a commercial late at night about kids who are hungry, you're like, let's just give them everything. And your head's like, no. Heart's like, let's give it all, we don't need anything. Head's like, wait a second, we do, we got bills to pay. So there's a balance between your head, 
Your head thinks logic, your heart's like faith. Your head's like, hang on, we have responsibilities. The heart's like, who cares? Like, shut up, head, shut up, heart. It's a battle sometimes, which is why I love, I, I love like, I love relationships because how many of you know you married somebody that's like the opposite of you? I'm not saying one of you has a heart, the other one has a head. What I mean is like sometimes, they're like, like in a relationship, like I'm the, I'm the spender, I'm the fun one. My wife is the saver and she's not in the service so maybe she didn't hear me say that. But sometimes in our, over our years, there's been tension of how we're gonna handle finances. Well, it's the same is true when it comes to, you know, do, do I act out of logic or do I walk by faith? What do I do? Well, I want you to know that I believe in the realm of generosity, we lead with the heart. We lead with the heart. We go heart first. Heart first, that could be a great name. Heart first. <laughs> Sorry, inside joke. Shouldn't have said that. Cheerful giver leads with the heart, with the heart. What I find is that my heart leans towards generosity. My head wants to be a little more calculated. And so the question becomes, how do I know if I can trust my heart? Doesn't the Bible say the heart is deceitful above all things? Maybe I shouldn't lead heart first. How do I know? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's a great question. Let me answer that for you. The Bible also says in Psalm 37, four, it says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the what? Say it with me. He will give you the desires of your heart. This is one of the most misrepresented passages in, in the Bible. And, and so what, what you hear a lot of times is somebody say, if you'll just love the Lord, he'll give you whatever you want. Like, well, I don't know that that's what it says because I love the Lord and I've wanted a Lamborghini since I was a kid. And he hasn't given me a Lambo yet. I had posters on my wall. I had models on my shelf. No Lambo yet. Now, I'm not giving up on that, but I don't think that's what that says. I don't think if you delight in God, he's gonna give you everything you want. What I think is that when you delight in the Lord, what that means is you spend time with him. You love him. And as you love the Lord, you're gonna begin to love what he loves. This is what happens in relationships. I think about my wife and I. When I met her, she was a country girl. Now, I liked a little bit of country music, but when I met her, she was about horses and cowboy boots, and, and guess what? I became about horses. I learned about horses, bits and bridles and saddles and blankets and, and, and all that stuff. And I started wearing cowboy boots and I got Wrangler jeans and I had a belt buckle that was big enough it could double as a dinner plate. I had the leather wallet that stuck out of my back pocket. I had the hat. Why? Because I loved her, I started loving what she loves. It just happened. Now she would say, I tricked her, it's not true, I didn't trick her. I fell in love with what she loves and I just believe that as you love the Lord, you're gonna love what he loves and you're gonna begin to desire things that he desires. It's why some of you, when you began to live for Jesus, the internal desires in your life began to shift. You started caring about things you didn't care about before. Not because someone told you, well, now that you're gonna you know, be a Christian, you have to stop doing this and stop doing that and start doing this. No, you started spending time with Jesus and because you spent time with Jesus, you started to desire what Jesus desires. Well, let me tell you, when you love the Lord and delight in him, you can trust your heart. You can trust your heart. And so how do I know that I can let my heart lead? Well, do I love God? Am I living according to his will and his word? Man, I'm trying the best that I can. Then I think you can trust your heart and you ought to let your heart lead. Now, the big question is, well, okay, but pastor, what if my heart is bigger than my bank account? You know, <laughs> the heart wants to be generous, but <laughs> you know, Wells Fargo says, not so fast. Well, that's why it's, I think it's so key to live by biblical principles. We gotta have an entire series early 2019. Just block all of 2019, block your Sundays, don't miss a single one. It's gonna be awesome. But we're gonna do a series early 2019 that talks about how do I live by biblical principles. I've never had anyone come to me and go, Pastor Jeff, I took the Bible and I started applying it and my life fell apart. Nobody. The Bible talks about, it talks about how do we save, how do we give, how do we invest, how do we, how do we put God first, how do we live according to a budget? There's a lot of wisdom in there, and we're gonna teach that. But I just wanna encourage you now by, by telling you, listen, there's gonna be times when your heart is, is, is leading you to do something you're not sure is possible, and I would just say this. I would say, don't let what's in your hand limit what's in your heart. I think back to 2012 when our church was taking a big step to get in this facility. We had challenged our church to pray about what God would have you to give, just like I'm asking you to do with this outreach offering. And my wife began praying about it and we knew it was a pretty big need. We needed to literally build out this entire 30,000 square foot space. 
And so we had talked about it and we had prayed and we'd made a lot of steps, aggressive steps to get ourselves out of debt. There wasn't a lot of extra. And so I was praying and I felt like God was beginning to put a number on my heart that was significantly larger than any other number I'd ever given in my life. And I remember God putting this on my heart and I was like shaking them off. Uh uh-uh. uh. It was like I was like back in my pitching, my baseball days, I'm on the mound and the catcher's calling for a curveball and I'm like, uh uh-uh, uh, it's not working. I kept shaking God off, like, oh, uh, that's no. And I wasn't shaking him off because I didn't want to give it. I was shaking him off because I knew if I did, it was going to bounce. And that would look really bad if the pastor's check bounced. So, I'm like, God, I know roughly what's in the account, and I know that there's nothing like that. And so I was praying, and my wife was praying, and I figured we'll get together, we'll compare notes, and whichever has the smaller, more logical number, we'll go with. <laughs> Real faith-filled pastor right there, huh? And so we finally got together, and we talked about it, and her... What God had put on her heart, her heart was exactly what God had put on my heart. Well, what do we do now? You know, I was really banking on you coming in low. And so we felt like what God said is don't let what's in your hand limit what's in your heart. And so we made a commitment that day. We said, God, here's the deal. I mean, we would love to give this amount, but we know we do not have it. Now, if there's things you want us to get rid of, you know, we will scale back, we'll stop going out to eat, we'll pinch our pennies, we'll do any side jobs, extra money, whatever we can do, we'll do it. And so we started doing that. We, got, we, we lived really, really tight for a six-month period. And as we were nearing the end of this six-month commitment, when we were gonna give our final offering, we were $3,000 short of giving what we felt like God had put on our heart. And I'm like, I don't, you know, I, I don't know what else we can do, God. And it's funny, because I was at work one day, and my wife sends me a text, and she said, do I care if I take the watch by a jeweler's? Now, let me explain this watch for just a minute. When I was in high school, my dad received a gift from one of his customers, and it was a Rolex, all right? Or at least we thought it was a Folex, okay? Pretty sure this thing was fake, because anytime you wore it, it just wasn't working. It, like, it seemed like it was never working. And so my dad never wore it, and I was like, you know, late high school, early college. I thought, how cool if I can rock a Rolex? Who cares if it's not real and doesn't work? It looks like I'm, I'm balling. And so I asked dad, can I have it? He's like, I don't care. It doesn't even work. I don't, it's, you know, it's probably pretty sure it's fake anyway. So I wore it off and on and uh, you know, eventually I just stick it in a drawer and forget all about it. I mean, it seemed like every once in a while the, the thing would work and most of the time I'd have it on. People were like, what time is it? I'm like, uh, I don't know, it's not working. <laughs> and, and so I just got embarrassed wearing it. I just put it away. Literally at least 15 years go by, sitting in my sock drawer. And, and so one day my wife texts me and says, do you mind if I take it by a jeweler just, just to find out if it's real? Guys, I tried to Google like how to know if this is real. And I thought, I, I would love to know, but I don't want the humiliation of finding out that it's fake. And then everyone at the jeweler's laughing at me like, come look at this guy. He thought this was a real Rolex. <laughs> what a dork. You know, that's what I thought they were gonna do. So I'm like, let her take the humiliation. That's fine. <laughs> you go, babe. So she goes, and then a couple hours later, I get a text back, all caps, it is real, exclamation points. I was like, get out of here. She, and then she writes, they want to buy it for $2,700. What do you wanna do? I'm like, sell, sell, sell. I mean, I don't, for all I know, it's hot. I don't, I don't want it anymore. Let's get rid of it. I'm not advocating using stolen property. I'm hoping and praying it's not, but a lot of time has passed, and I'm believing in grace. <laughs> Definitely don't steal something so that you can give to the outreach offering. <laughs> I wanna make that clear. LifePoint does not support thieving. After I make a Hamburglar reference and all this stuff, it's, <laughs> what did you take away from church? Well, so, but the crazy thing was is we were able to save up another $300 and give what God had put on our heart. And, and we had no idea. It was hilarious, guys. Hilaros, that's what it was. It was crazy to look back and go, God, you knew it all along. Like he knew what was sitting in my sock drawer and he knew, like he had been saving that for just that moment so that we could do what he had put on our heart to do. And what I'm telling you is let your heart lead and then you trust the supplier to provide. A cheerful giver leads with the heart. He leads with the heart. Here's the fourth and final. A cheerful giver knows that you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Let's come back to this idea. You reap what you sow. Listen, if you sow generosity, you're gonna reap generosity. But I wanna be clear, we don't give to get, okay? We do not, this is not a, a way to manipulate God. I don't know if you ever sat up late at night and maybe caught some TV preacher that's like, for your gift of $100, you'll get a thousand fold. We'll send you a bottle with water from the Jordan River and a jawbone of a donkey and give now. Operators are standing by. I'm not, what I'm telling you is that when we give with pure motives, a pure heart, and we honor the Lord, he honors that. 
but we don't give to get. At LifePoint, we have a value that says we get to give. Like This is a privilege to be a part of what God is doing in our generation, in our community, across the world. We get to be a part of this. But what I find is the people that do give tend to be blessed with the ability to give more. And I just want you to know, I believe God wants to, he wants you to be trustworthy. And when you are generous, God sees that you're one who can be trusted with more. Our motivation is not to get, but you sow generosity, watch what God does. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs eleven twenty five, 25, a generous person will prosper. A generous person will prosper. And whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. That means you pour generosity into others. Pour generosity into this community. Watch the way God pours back into you. Watch the refreshing that comes into your life. I just see God do it over and over. Listen, I know that much of this message has been about financial generosity because that tends to be the way we think, but generosity is so much more broad than that. What area of your life do you need to show generosity? Maybe it's with your time. Maybe you look at your schedule and you just think, I just don't have any time. I don't have any time to give back. I don't have any time to volunteer. I don't have any time to, to serve at the church. I want you to know you have just as much time as the next person. You have different priorities, just as much time. And I would encourage you, we all have, we have time for what we carve time out for. Like, like there's time. Maybe you need to be generous with your time, generous with your family. Maybe your family's been getting the leftovers. I can tell you, they don't want leftovers. We've all been living on leftovers for the last couple of days, aren't we? They're good for a day or two. We're ready for some, like, cook me a steak. That's what I want now. Don't open that fridge again. I don't want anything in a Ziploc bag anymore. So let's, let's not give leftovers to the people that matter most. Let's not give leftovers to the Lord. Let's, let's make it a priority. God, I'm gonna make time. I'm gonna be generous with my time. Maybe it's generous with your words. I guarantee you 100% of the people that you pass by this week could use an encouragement. They could use encouraging words. What if you were just generous with, with your words? in the way you bless people and you speak life over people? What if you made the decision that you're gonna be generous with forgiveness? A lot of times when it comes to forgiveness, we, we want it, but we don't wanna give it. Oh, you don't know what they did to me. No, I don't. But I know that we're told to forgive as we've been forgiven. And so if I'm to forgive you the way that my heavenly Father has forgiven me, oh my word, there's no limit. So let's be generous with our forgiveness. So let's do this. I wanna take just about 15 to 20 seconds of, of kind of quiet. And I want us to let God speak into this moment. I believe for all of us, there's an area of our life where he's pressing in and challenging and encouraging. And if we could just hear from him, maybe there's, there's one aspect of generosity, maybe an area where we could demonstrate some cheerfulness to those that are around us. Let's capture that. Maybe you wanna write it down or punch it in your home. But for maybe 15 seconds or so, would you just say, God, what are you saying to me right now? What area do I need to show generosity?